Well, good morning. Welcome to Walden Community Church. It's so nice to see all of you, to have all of you here. And I'm sure now that COVID is passing and people are getting more comfortable with going out, we are seeing a rise in church attendance once again. And of course, we're seeing familiar faces, seeing new faces. So I thought, you know what? This would be a good time to have a refresher course on what we do here. And we're calling this Church Where You Live. Church Where You Live. Walden Church is a local, non-denominational community church. We are, we are not a church on the highway or byway. We are smack dab in the community. And our, our neighbors are literally our neighbors. So in many ways, we are the church where you live. But this is also a mission statement because the word church can also be a verb, right? And, and so it becomes a command. It should be what we do. We should church where we live. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at church, what we do, what our mission is, how we navigate uh, being a church, and how we serve, perhaps, in a community like we do. Because I'm sure we all have different backgrounds. We all have different uh, ways of being brought up with church, different relationships with church. We, we were all raised differently. We all have different priorities. We all have different traditions. I remember growing up, uh, the only times we ever skipped church was when we were on vacation. I mean, my parents went to church every single Sunday, and they still do. So I want you to think about that. What, what traditions does your family have? Think about it. Uh, is there a ritual or event or a, a prayer that you have passed on uh, that you now pass on to your own children? Did you have traditions about how you name children in your family? Do you have a prayer at dinner or do you have a tradition about how we all open presents? Maybe before your kids were even born, you were thinking about old traditions or new traditions that you wanted to pass on to your children. And there's probably still more, right? There's still more that we would like to teach them, but we just haven't gotten around to it. Maybe, it'd be, maybe it's in your goal to have a prayer time with your whole family, or maybe a family Bible study, or maybe it's something as simple as, hey, I'd really like to have everyone eat dinner at the same time. Traditions are, they're important, aren't they? That's what makes memories. That's what helps us uh, bond as a family. Maybe there's something that your parents used to do and uh, you still remember it and it's something that you love. But maybe you didn't, you didn't implement it in your own family because there was something in you that said, uh, my, my, kids, my kids will think it's dumb. Or maybe you've stood outside the door of your teenager's bedroom and you've wanted to just go in there and pray with them and you felt, eh, they're too old. Why do we do that? Why do we rob ourselves? Why do we rob our families of tradition? You know, the Shema is a Hebrew poem. It's in the Bible. It's part of Judaism and it's part of their traditions. It's so much so a part of their traditions that Jesus quoted a portion of it when he was asked a very important question. Rabbi, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus replied with this portion from Deuteronomy chapter 6, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. You know, an inter interesting thing about the entire portion of scripture, the entire poem that they recite, is that when someone does recite it, they add a few words at the beginning. They add, God, faithful king. And that brings the number of words in the Shema to 248, which is the exact number of organs in your body. This symbolically indicates that the worshiper is dedicating their entire self, their entire body to serving God. And here's what the, here's what the entire uh, chapter, here's what the entire verse sounds like. It says, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. 
You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So God says these words, right? This, this law, these books, these are your inheritance. And the story is not just history. It's, it's also your story. It's also your family's story. This is heritage. This is tradition. And Jews today recite this passage, not only as prayer, but also as remembrance. But maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, you know, that's nice, but I'm not Jewish. Okay, maybe your family is Dutch or Irish or German or Scott, and that's fine. And with all of those backgrounds and family, your, your group, right, your family, your household, you've inherited other traditions, other identities. But think about this. Your relationship with Jesus Christ is something that you have also inherited. It is also a part of your identity, and it's really the most important one. Romans 8 says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. See, the Bible is a story that tells you about your eternal inheritance. It says that we are all God's children. That means we all have privilege, we all have right within God's family. And so the question I have for you today is, how important then is church to your family? How important is church to your family? How important is faith in your home? Is your Bible in one room and your family photo album in the other? Because the Bible is not just a story about an ancient family, it's also a story about your family. The Bible should go right next to your family photo albums, right next to your diaries, right next to your home movies. Our homes should be places where we pray. Our homes should be places where we share Bible stories and that we talk about the lessons that we learn. Our faith should not only be reserved for this building. If, if we are going to be the church where we live, then it first needs to begin where we live, in our houses. Josh McDowell wrote, the number one fear of Christians today is that they will not pass on their values, their morals, and their faith to the next generation. Have you ever watched a relay race? As the lead sprinter on each team runs the first leg of the race, the next runner gets set. They anxiously await their teammates' arrival and begin running before the lead overtakes them. Then the crucial moment arrives and the lead runner passes the baton to the middle runner. The process is repeated twice more in the race and as each athlete surrenders the baton to the next. And as any good track coach will tell you, the relay is won or lost in the transfer of the baton. Just a miscalculation or a misstep or a hesitation can cost the entire race. Many of us as Christian parents, grandparents, pastors, teachers, aunts, uncles, at one point in our life, we are gonna wonder if we are missing that beat missing the passing of the baton. And it's not a passing that, that we want to miss. We worry that our students or our children are not going to have a tight grip, and, and our bigger fear is that maybe they'll drop it. So I wanted to look at the Shema from Deuteronomy 6 and look at tradition and see what the scriptures have for us, because even though it's 2022, I still think the Bible teaches us and it has relevance for us today. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 says, And these words I command you shall today be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. That's a lot of teachable moments in your life, isn't it? But did you notice who the subject matter was of those sentences. I stressed, I stressed a particular word. Did you hear it? It was you, right? You need to build 
real relationships. You need to build real relationships because who is the one doing the teaching? You, right? You. And I suppose there are those of us who can say, well, you know, my kids are all grown up. There are other ones of us who could say, well, I don't even have kids. But I would say that Christ calls us beyond just our immediate family, doesn't he? When Jesus was asked what the most important commandment was, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then he says, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, part of being the church where you live is being a good neighbor, right? Jesus felt the greatest commandment in all the scriptures was a two-parter. And the other half of Deuteronomy, his answer from Deuteronomy, the other half is from Leviticus. Deuteronomy is a law book. It's the story of Israel's history. And it teaches people how to interact with each other and how to get along. Leviticus is a priestly book, and it teaches us how to worship. Jesus' greatest commandment is a union between a call to love God and a call to love others. Now, as a church, we don't have the luxury of saying, my kids are all grown up, or I don't have any kids. The Shema says, you shall teach the children, whomever the next generation is, however you come in contact with them. The Shema is a tradition in Jewish history because in it, there is an instruction. And the instruction is, you pass this on. You pass it on. And, and passing on our values to the next generation, it happens in the context of us building a relationship with them. It can be parent and child, it can be grandparent, grandchild, it can be teacher, it can be student. In one way or the other, we all interact with younger people in our lives. And if we are to pass along the values, then it first requires building a relationship. So for us to truly model Jesus' command to love God, to love others, it means we need to build healthy relationships. It means we've got to put in the time. It means identifying those young people in our life and committing our time to foster their growth. Deuteronomy 6 says, who are you responsible for? Who do you care about? Who is important to you? You have to build those relationships. I mean, we'll say those people are important to me. They are important to my life. I want to pass on my teachings to them. I want, I want them to know the riches of God's grace. So we build relationships. And second, we live like role models. We live like role models. Starting at verse 6, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you till day shall be on your heart. Now, whether you admit it or not, you are being watched. All of the things that you do, you model whether it's by accident or by design. You strongly broadcast your beliefs about right and wrong, about morality, about immorality, about living, about life, about your faith, every single day in how you live. You know, one of my very favorite quotes is from a theologian named Brendan Manning, and I quote it many times a year. He says, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. And that is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. And I would say it like this, what you say and what you do says volumes about what you believe. When you're standing out in the front yard with your neighbor and the two of you are yucking it up, what are you talking about? What jokes are you telling? What words are you using? Does he know you're a Christian? Do the people at work know you're a Christian? When, when you're playing cards, do they know you're a Christian? When you're at parents group, when you're at karate class, when you're at soccer, when you're at brunch, when you're at the hair salon, 
The goal of the Christian church is to make more Christians and to make better Christians. That's a foundational belief. And if we're going to pass on biblical values to the next generation, we have to model those values in our own life. Yes, we should live differently. Members of the church should talk differently. We should act differently. We should be involved differently. We must be better so that the kingdom grows more. We need to be the better so there can be more. Jesus' compassion must be our compassion. His forgiveness must be our forgiveness. His healing hands must be our healing hands. His words must be our words. Before we can ever begin to impress Christian traditions on the hearts and minds of others, they must already be a part of us to pass them on. We need to live as role models. If we want our sons and daughters to accept the idea that there is absolute truth or absolute standards of right and wrong, they need to see it in us. They need to see that we believe it, that we live it. And no, that doesn't mean that you have to live a perfect life. Nobody's saying that. We just have to live a consistent life. Does what I read and watch, does what I talk about in the home, do those things reflect what I believe? Because every part of my life is up for scrutiny. And I think we sometimes make exceptions for ourselves, right? We, we partake in these little pieces of darkness, these little indulgences. But we have to know that the next generation sees all of that. Our neighbors see that. Our colleagues see that. We might be able to justify it. We might be able even to explain it. We might even think it's perfectly fine. But is it something that you want to pass on? Finally, we need to serve as teachers. Verses 7 through 9 say, You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down. And when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The words there in that phrase that say, teach diligently, that is one Hebrew word. It's the word shanan. Shanan means to sharpen. So the Shema instructs us that we use the events of life as teachable moments. In Jesus' day, every single member of the household had a role. The father went to synagogue. The father learned to pray so that the father knew the prayers and he knew the stories in the holy book because he then had to go home and teach those to his family. He had to be the rabbi in his family. And then the wife had to run the entire home. The daughters and the sons, they did most of the labor. And if we saw this play out today, we would just say, oh, well, everybody has chores. They're all doing chores. But it was more than chores because sons would work alongside fathers. Daughters would work alongside mothers. And together in those moments of work, that's where the teaching and the wisdom was imparted. These long hours of side by side gave them opportunity to talk. And that was when a parent teaches child. That's when a teen hears his father's perspective on honesty. That's when a mother can share her concepts of marriage. Our last foundational belief here in our church at Walden Church is that every member is a minister. Every member is a minister. Because the bottom line is church doesn't work when only one person serves. When Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, he said, He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Did you notice that every single one of those roles in the church was plural, right? The idea was that the church is made up of many apostles, many 
prophets, many evangelists, many shepherds, many teachers. We even see the same idea in the Old Testament. When we read the book of the law, Exodus 19 says, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. Now that's our identity, okay? That's our inheritance as God's children. And then in verse six it says, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The Christian faith is not about a few priests. It's about an entire kingdom that is made up of only priests. It is when you look at the chessboard, every single character is a bishop. We are all representatives of God's grace. We are all models and examples of God's love. You know, there's an old African proverb that says, it takes a village to raise a child. And when I was a kid, I think there was no show on television that better modeled this than the Andy Griffith show. Because little Opie lived with his dad, Andy, but his dad was often at work, or maybe he was out on a case. And so Opie would run around town, and you would watch all of Mayberry listen to Opie, and they would give him counsel. Maybe it was Aunt B or Barney Fife or Gomer or Goober or Floyd the Barber or Otis, right? Everyone followed his story and they all gave him advice along the way. Each of those characters took a moment where they helped raise that boy. And then that boy grew up to be an amazing movie director. When Opie ran into the barber shop, Floyd did not brush him off and say, he ain't my kid, let somebody else raise him. Did he? Passing values and traditions on to the next generation requires our time and our commitment. And we have to remember that we are always biblical role models, even when we think nobody's looking. And it means reaching beyond our own four walls. It means we have to embrace people in this neighborhood and be the church where we live. In the book of Mark, after Jesus gives his answer for the greatest commandment, the scribe who asked him says, you are right, teacher, you have truly said that he is one and there is no other beside him, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. I love that response. Because here is a Jewish teacher who understands that God's law is not really about the law. He says loving others is more important than all the ritual. All of the religions have their liturgy, have their pomp and circumstance, have their ornamentation, right? But what God desires more than anything else is our love. And we know the scribe's response was correct because look at what Jesus says next. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Isn't that what we are all trying to do here? Isn't that the moment? That's the invitation, right? That's, that's, what we, that's why we do what we do. We all want to draw closer to the kingdom of God, to make our world like his world, to, to enact thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, so what do we do? Well, as families begin to come back to every church across the United States, that means their children come back. And right now, just for instance, at, at our church, we do not have a paid staff member to oversee the children's department. We just haven't come back yet from COVID. We, we have a nursery sometimes when we need it, but we don't have anybody dedicated to it. We have a preschool classroom. We have one classroom for kids K through five. We have junior high boys, we have, we have them. We have junior high girls, we get them as a group, and then we have the high school. Last week, we had 15 kids in one classroom. We need more teachers. We need more volunteers. 
We need more eyes, more hands, more feet. Our youth director, John, he keeps growing the youth group every week, but he still needs adults who can help with crowd control. Now, I've been involved in every single aspect of children's ministry. I've been the kid in the classroom. I have been a teen volunteer. I have been a single young adult volunteer. I have been both the director as a parent and as a non-parent. And now I'm just the parent. Here are my favorite benefits from youth group and Sunday school. Number one, kids learn that church is fun, that it's safe. Number two, children develop relationships with other trusted Christian adults. Number three, kids connect with other Christian kids. Number four, kids can learn from others, their creativity and their perspective, not just their moms. Number five, parents build relationships that can provide resources for helping minister to our kids at home. Number six, it reinforces lessons kids learn at home. Number seven, it provides a safe place for kids to practice having faith discussions outside of their home. And number eight, it provides a safe place for older children, teens, and adults to express their gifts and serve God and his people. And actually, the Sunday school that we all experience now is very different from how Sunday school began. Sunday school began literally as school. It started in Britain in the 1780s as a way for the church to outreach to poor children. Poor children who would spend 12 hours a day, six days a week working in a factory. These children were unable to attend school and therefore they did not know how to read. Christians wanted to provide those children with an opportunity to learn and read. And Sunday was those children's only day off. What started as one school grew to over two million children plus their families. That took only 60 years. The first Sunday school did not set out to impact already Christian kids who were wearing their Sunday best. It started as a way to empower working class kids to break out of the cycle of poverty and they used the Bible as their textbook. Most of the leaders in Sunday school today are teens and adults that just simply volunteer their time because they love Jesus and they love kids. That's it. And you know what? Some of them don't necessarily even love kids that much. And that's okay. Because they love Jesus that much. Most of the leaders in Sunday school, they are not school teachers. They're not ever taught on how to teach the Bible or how to teach faith-based learning. They, they've probably gotten a little bit of training at a church and now they just simply follow a workbook that was written by somebody else. Those are things that you can do. Again, if they can do it, you can do it. They're not education experts. (laughs) They're just faithful. They're just serving. So my only action plan for you today is I want you to prayerfully consider rearranging your schedule. If you're in first service, I'm asking you to stick around for a second hour to help. If you attend the adult Bible study, I would like you to be willing to step aside for a month here and there to help us with Sunday school. If you attend second service, I would like you to think about attending first service so that you can teach and lead in the second service. And perhaps giving up your mornings every day for one week this summer to help us with Vacation Bible School. Maybe even coming in on Wednesdays to help with our youth group. Because as we come back to church and we begin attending church once again, we should be reminded of why we all come, why we're all here. We are here to love God and to love others. We are here to make more Christians and better Christians and None of us are off the hook. Every member is a minister. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the church. We thank you that this is 
the plan. This is the plan and it's always been the plan. You love your bride and your bride loves you. Lord, as we await your second coming, may we continue the work that you have left for us, that we would reach the ends of the earth, that we would administer grace, that we would extend a healing and forgiving hand, and that we would teach people your teachings. But not only that, but we would teach them to obey your teachings. May we continue to be an influence. May we continue to reach the next generation. May our hearts be for those who are still not here. May we see those empty seats as our mission to continue to grow your church. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for coming and uh, listening to this message once again. I'll remind you that this is a uh, audio file or a video file that you can always clip and copy the link at the top and you can share it to your social media wall. You can share this message with your friends and uh, people that know you. Let them know uh, what you learned or perhaps share this by email with someone you think needs to hear this message today. And because we're talking about the church and the local church and attending, that means we'd love you to attend Walden Community Church. We are deep in the heart of Montgomery, Texas. We have two services every single Sunday, one at 930, which is a traditional service. We sing all your favorite hymns and we even have a choir. And our 11 o'clock service is our contemporary service where you can come casual and we also have a worship band. 11 o'clock is also our hour where we have Sunday school. We have something for everyone, preschool all the way through high school. And we also have a full running youth group all through the year. That means as we head into summer, we don't stop, we don't take breaks. Our, our summer schedule has already filled up. Our kids are gonna be having fun and being together uh, in, in a healthy Christian environment all summer long, every Wednesday at six o'clock. Every Wednesday at six o'clock, you can send your kid uh, fifth grade on up. They can come over on their bike, their skateboard. They can walk. We're so close, right? We'll even feed them for you. That's right. We'll feed them dinner and we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being the church where we all live. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.